This Civic Media Podcast is sponsored by UW Organ and Tissue Donation. Organ donations are desperately needed, and now is the right time to become an organ donor. Talk to your family. Get the dot. Save lives. Go to HeroicDeed.com. Good morning. This is Sandy Williams, the Earl Ingram Show. Say I'm sitting in for Earl today. Earl is otherwise disposed, predisposed, I guess. He can't be here today. Calvin, how are you this morning? I'm doing pretty good, Earl. You know that uh, the inclement weather we had yesterday disappeared awfully quickly. It did. Winter came and left. It was like uh, it just wanted to prove that it existed, and then it disappeared again. So Earl, so uh, um, Earl is gone this morning, and uh, this is going to be an interesting segue. <clears throat> it might suggest why he's gone, but Kelvin, have you ever had a colonoscopy? I can't say that I have. Well, you know, it's a rite of passage. Uh, it's a rite of passage that's afforded to all of Americans through the benefit of Medicare or our health insurers. And it's a passage that announces that middle age onset is here and uh, and now you need to get tested. And, and the colonoscopy process uh, sounds awful. Uh, the preparation for it indeed is. I'm sure many listeners here have been through this process, but the procedure itself is like a non-process. I, I can confess that uh, I had one of these things. Uh, I've had several of them, but the most recent one I had, um, I was sitting impatiently in the waiting room. Uh, and finally, I turned to the receptionist and I said, when are they going to do this procedure? And she said, oh, sir, they, they've done the procedure. You're just waiting for your ride home. So they have some magic anesthesia that kind of erases the whole process from your mind. So whatever it is that happens to you, who knows? But uh, it, it comes and goes. And, and uh, But it is an announcement of middle age. And it's also interesting. It's a, it's a process in which the medical industry mines human beings. Uh, they're looking for things called polyps. And if they find a polyp in you, they can come back and do it again in three years or five years. But if they don't find the polyp, the insurance provisions don't allow them to come back for 10 years. And it's an amazingly expensive procedure. It's one of the reasons why American medical care is so expensive, because it costs almost as much, apparently, to have a colonoscopy as it does to have a baby. So, you know, I think a colonoscopy is an easier burden to carry, but uh, it's uh, anyway. So that's our friend Earl is is in the process of heading on for one of those and can't be here today. I'm confident that he would rather be here today. Don't you think, uh, Callan? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, doing this radio show is definitely better than what they do to you uh, during a colonoscopy. Well, luckily he's hopefully will be asleep for what they're going to do to him this morning, but the through the night probably was not yeah. a fun experience. <laughs> no, no, it's, um, <clears throat> let's put it this way. The anticipation is much worse than the procedure. Uh, if, uh, I'm sure there'll be some caller that might, might be uh, willing to share uh, the same kind of uh, experience. So I sat up kind of stark a couple of nights ago in the middle of the night and suddenly realized that what I think what we're watching happen right now with the Trump administration feels and looks much more like what used to happen and what does happen, I guess, but what really used to happen with a king as they assembled their court. And so I went back <clears throat> and looked at some of the history. Uh, for instance, King George III, King George III was the king of England in 1776. He was the very king that the revolution was aimed at. Uh, and King George had a court, and the court was a mix of family figures, political figures, wealthy noble people. Uh, and the main thing that was expected of the court was that they be absolutely loyal to the king. And uh, the uh, royal courtiers, as they were called, uh, many of them 
some of them became the officials of government. So the exchequer and the various positions of government were filled out of this group of courtiers. But the, the, the courtiers were mainly expected to be, to be totally loyal to the king and they would fall out of favor and their status would be diminished at large and uh, on the court if there was any uh, act of disloyalty or any perceived act of disloyalty. In fact, you know, for some kings, uh, Henry VIII, for instance, uh, was wont to lop off the heads of those who were disloyal. Uh, and same was true of uh, Louis XVI in, in France. Uh, Louis's conduct with his court was so outlandish that it probably, in some respects, led to the French Revolution. But um, we can look at history and we can find these episodes in history, but in which uh, extreme loyalty is required, personal loyalty is required to the leader. And, um, and typically it's in environments that, that we as Americans uh, were found so repellent that we fled those countries and, and came here. England had another period of time, which kind of smacks a little bit of the current. Uh, and that was the period of Oliver Cromwell. So Cromwell lived in England. I think anyone who studied English history at all has heard of Oliver Cromwell. He led England from 1649 to 1660. He unseated the kings, but it wasn't like he was unseating the kings to create a democratic movement. He was unseating the kings because they were the establishment and he was an anti-establishment figure who ran against, who basically had a movement that was based on being against the then establishment, which was the Catholic Church. Uh, and, and he installed a, a government that was based on a Puritan morality. And, and there was an effort to infuse the laws of England with, uh, with Puritanical liturgical law. Um, <clears throat> there began to be an upwelling against that to some extent. And so then Cromwell decided that he would uh, dissolve parliament, which was then in existence. And he became what was called the Lord Protector. And I would simply urge us all to be concerned about uh, whether or not we ever have a leader who, is, who seems to be uh, wanting to become the Lord Protector. But uh, Cromwell was a period <clears throat> that ended up being a period of ruthless execution of opposition it was a period of military tribunals, <clears throat> imprisonment for disloyalty. Loyalty to Cromwell was absolutely central. And uh, it was the beginning of the end, really, of the, of the English monarchical system. There, was, there were kings reinstalled after uh, Cromwell, but Parliament had more power after, after Cromwell. <clears throat> and and uh, Cromwell was, is, a, is a sort of an ugly blot on the history of, uh, of England. And, and we find today across the world, we're finding a similar sort of a trend running in other countries, running in the direction of authoritarianism. And we can look at, we, we can look at uh, uh, different um, situations. We can look at Russia. I mean, Russia is an obvious example. But Look at Turkey. Turkey uh, under Erdogan has moved distinctly in the direction of more authoritarianism and more loyalty to uh, required loyalty to Erdogan. And the free press in particular has been under attack and the media has been under attack in Turkey. But a country that has received lots of attention from the right in America and is, uh, is, is led by a fellow named Viktor Orban, the country of Hungary, and in Hungary, there has been an ongoing movement, a, a distinct movement led by Orban in the direction of creating a much more authoritarian uh, government. And for some reason, Viktor Orban is sort of a, a darling of the right. He's come and he's, he spoke to some conservative uh, conventions here in the United States. And he's viewed by the right as being maybe sort of a heroic figure in terms of what he's doing to the government in Hungary. But what he's doing to the government in Hungary is kind of frightening. And, and most of the European Union is actually quite upset and has there's been a good deal of, dis, of debate within the European Union about what it is that should be done about Hungary since they seem to be violating so much in the way of civil liberties and, and operating uh, in, in opposition to the, the general tenets of, 
of uh, democracy that's that's a basis for the countries in the European Union. So Orban has been attacking the, the media, the freedom of the medium of the media. He's uh, weakened the judicial independence, attacked judges, attacked courts, uh, uh, attempted to uh, uh, nominate and appoint the judiciary that would be loyal to him. He's undermined the checks and balances of the government there. And he created a, a hybrid form of de uh, democracy uh, that's, a, that's a blend of authoritarianism and democracy. And I would argue that it's very much uh, like what is currently being discussed on the right as illiberal democracy. And we can talk about that briefly when we, when we come back, but um, illiberal democracy is the basis for the Project 2025 uh, document. And it's even without being labeled that discussed uh, in Project 2025. And the most important element of Project 2025, the one they talk about most, <clears throat> is the strengthening of the White House, the establishment within the White House of the capacity to micromanage the rest of the government. And their reasoning is that the, the president is the only elected official in the executive arm. And because he's the elected official, he's speaking with the voice of the people. And therefore, the voice of the people, they say, should, should have every reason to be regulating every aspect of what goes on in the executive branch. And so uh, their, their Project 2025 contemplates creating a government that is capable at the White House level of micromanaging all the departments, micromanaging the Department of Justice, micromanaging the FBI, micromanaging the U.S. attorney offices around the country, micromanaging the EPA, uh, making sure that no rule gets adopted, no person gets prosecuted for a, for a, a criminal a violation. No, nothing is done by the government that doesn't pass muster in the White House. What does that sound like? And how will that feel? Uh, we'll talk more about that when we come back. You're listening to Civic Media. You can tune into any of our live shows on any radio station across the state with the Civic Media app. Find us in your phone's app store and listen anytime, anywhere. Good morning. You've not, you have not—you don't have London on the radio. This is the Earl Ingram Show. Sandy Williams sitting in for Earl Ingram. That's a little bit of God Save the King. Uh, it's a song we escaped in 1776. But I'm playing it today because uh, I'm talking about the extent to which it sort of feels like what's happening in Washington right now is not just the assembly of a cabinet, but the assembly of a court, okay? And, and the characteristics of a court, we talked about it uh, in the first segment, but the characteristics of the members of a court tended to be the rich, the noble, uh, but the, but the the extremely loyal. Okay, the the court, the a condition to being a courtier and having all the favors of the king was to, in exchange for that, to be uh, loyal to the blood, to the king, and uh, loyalty apparently is obviously one of the primary. 
characteristics that's being sought after in the current uh, cabinet. We talked a bit before uh, as well about the trends around the world towards uh, moving governments in the direction of authoritarianism. Uh, talked about the, the key indicators of authoritarianism uh, that, that has been in many respects, I think, duplicated by what's going on here. I mean, we, you know, you can look at the playbook for authoritarianism, the, the centralization of power in the executive branch, exactly what's called for in Project 2025. The marginalization of opposition, uh, the claim of rigged elections or the rigging of elections, uh, the attacks on the independent hostile media and the attempt to uh, to denigrate and to uh, devalue the media and, and to have it lose its credibility. The increased use of state violence, meaning arresting protesters or cracking down on unpopular ethnic or other kinds of minorities, and populist rhetoric, where, where the leader claims to be uh, uh, saving the people, being the only legitimate defender of the national sovereignty, to save the government, to save the culture, to be the protector of the cultural identity. You know, what does that sound like? I mean, that sounds in so many ways like the last campaign and what was being argued uh, on, the, on the right. And then we were, I think, before the break, talking about uh, what's going on around the country. And in particular, I think Viktor Orban of Hungary and how it is that Viktor Orban seems to have become a darling of the conservatives here in America, the conservative movement in America. He's spoken, uh, I think, that the Heritage Foundation supported him to come and give a speech. Uh, and he's talked about a great on the, uh, a great deal from the right uh, and, and seems to be revered in some fashion. Uh, Donald Trump talks about him a lot and calls him a great leader. But most of the people in the European Union, the other leaders in the European Union, are sort of appalled by what it is that's happening in Hungary <clears throat> and what Viktor Orban is orchestrating in the way of a shift from a, a democratic regime to something that is much more like an authoritarian regime. And we can, when we delve into Project 2025 and we see what it's asking for, which is basically the creation of this White House that is, that is populated by a, a large number of, of operatives, people who are then capable of micromanaging the rest of federal government, micromanaging the EPA, micromanaging the Department of Justice. Uh, first of all, a big part of that that's required is that you have cabinet officials who fill the cabinet jobs in each of those places who are absolutely loyal to the White House and will implement the policies of the White House. You then also create within the White House the capability of watching over that uh, one of the things that Project 2025 calls for in the first 40 pages of it is the creation of an office of personnel that allows the incoming president to fire as many people in the, in the, in the federal government as can be fired legally by the White House. And that number is easily 5,000 5, personnel, but it looks like it could be as large as 15,000 uh, heads that could roll uh, and then those jobs would all have to be refilled. The refilling of those jobs would be carried out uh, under a loyalty test to the White House and its policies and to its leader. And the problem with that kind of a, an, uh, of a structure for the government, if that's really the way the government's going to operate, when a Republican gets elected, 15,000 heads roll, and now you have a whole bunch of new people who have to get the jobs have to get filled, and they implement a set of policies. Well, what happens if the American public decides they don't like those policies and four years later they elect a Democrat? 15,000 heads roll. And now we have the pendulum swinging, not just further and further, but faster and faster in a manner that is highly destabilizing. So the fact is that the only way this kind of centralized government can work and be stable is if that central leader is there for a long time. You can't switch leaders every four years and have a government that gets unfolded and refolded every four years that has policies that 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 swing from all the way to the left to all the way to the right every four years. 
uh, that would be so destabilizing, it would destroy our economy, it would destroy our capacity to have business planning, it would destroy our capacity to plan personally our futures. Um, and so what's really implicitly required under the Project 2025 concept of the American government with the White House micromanaging everything is a, a president who is president for longer than four years longer probably than eight years. It's one of the reasons why authoritarian regimes last a long time uh, is that it's kind of required that they last a long time under the, under the procedures that are set up where a, where a strong arm, a strong man runs, runs the whole show. And so <clears throat> I think we, people talk about authoritarianism and those on the right would, would say that this is hysteria. What are you talking about? But I think we need to watch in the world. I think we can watch history and we can say that, look, we're all human beings. We all suffer from the, the foibles of human nature. And when you hand someone the capacity to have all that power, the likelihood is that they might grab it. And if they grab it, what's the outcome from that? Uh, we'll talk more about this when we return. You're an organ donor, right? Well, here's a tragic fact. Approximately 20 people die each day waiting for precious donated organs. You could make a life-saving decision simply by getting that important dot on your driver's license. That little dot shows those who need to know that you've made a decision to donate organs at a critical time. Go to HeroicDeed.com to learn more about the importance of organ donation and how you can make your wishes known. Talk to your family. Get the dot. Save lives. HeroicDeed.com Good morning, the Earl Ingram Show. Sandy Williams sitting in for Earl Ingram. Uh, mu playing music here today about the King of America, since I think some of us have a have a concern or a fear that uh, that's what we're hatching, or that's at least what someone would like us to be hatching. Uh, you can call in. The call-in number is 855-752-4842. We'd like to hear from you. Talking this morning about... Uh, how, and how much it feels like what's happening in Washington right now is not just the assembly of the of the uh, um, cabinet, but the but the putting together of the king's court. You know, the courtiers uh, and and the, the people that are being appointed to the cabinet in so many ways feel like courtiers. There are many of them billionaires themselves, wealthy uh, gadflies, people who are uh, social gadflies. Uh, media gadflies, uh, people in, in who primarily, the primary thing they have is a strong personal loyalty to Donald Trump. Not necessarily a long history of, of being a Republican, but a history of being extremely loyal uh, to Donald Trump. Um, and so, um, you know, I thought we should maybe look at this court that he's putting together and who are these courtiers and what kind of danger do they pose? Because uh, after being someone who subjected myself to 900 pages of Project 2020, 20, 2025 to try and figure out what it is that uh, might be hatched in the way of a government, uh, it, came, it became very clear that Project 2025 is based on this concept of an illiberal democracy. And in fact, those, those sort of ideologues, the, the ideologically 
uh, bound people who were part of drafting Project 2025 will talk to you about the illiberal democracy. They will, in fact, be unlikely to use the term democracy and will want to use the term republic as a distinction from a democracy. A republic being something that's run by, for instance, the U.S. Senate. Uh, who, which is elected on the, mat, on, the, on the basis of geography, not people. A republic is something more complicated and nuanced than a democracy where uh, one vote, one person, one vote prevails and we decide things on that democratic basis. But uh, the right is much more interested in, in this kind of republic notion. And the illiberal democracy is, is described as that because what they want to put, what, what they want to do is tilt the, the scale, put the scale in the, on the balance of power in government and put the scale in the direction of putting more power in the hands of the executive branch. And, and by the executive branch, they don't just mean the departments, they mean the White House. They mean the person who occupies the White House. And they want the White House to be the, the entity that controls in every way all elements of the executive branch. And the executive branch is the way we execute all the laws of our country. Uh, it is, that's what the term executive means. The laws are passed by Congress, but they are executed, put into place by the executive branch. And so the Project 2025 would have the White House capable of running every aspect of the Department of Justice, every aspect of every agency. And the, and the president seems to be appointing people who will be accommodating him in that regard. Um, and so, for instance, let's take Robert Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. And, and the question is, does the appointment of someone like Robert Kennedy Jr. pose dangers to us? Or, or what should we begin be concerned about the appointment of someone like uh, Robert Kennedy Jr.? Um, and so what does he stand for? Well, I guess the question I'd say is, do we care about it? Well, I think we will care about it. Let's say that Instead of COVID having happened in 2019, let's say COVID happens in 2025. How would Robert F. Kennedy Jr. lead our health, our health agencies in terms of their response to COVID uh, in 2025? And, and I think it's, it's concerning because Robert Kennedy has demonstrated the fact that he doesn't necessarily listen to all the facts. I mean, I'm all for cynics. I'm all for skeptics. I'm for people who want to question big pharma as to whether they're uh, actually always uh, operating in the public interest. But there's no question that vaccinations have saved millions and millions of lives. I come from a generation that watched the horrors of polio, and I watched polio disappear from the face of the earth in three years, you know, from the onset of the of the discovery of Salk vaccine to the end of polio as a problem could be counted in months, okay? And there were many people dying of polio in, in my youth, and it, polio was a, a youthful disease. Many of us are alive today because we didn't die of one of the childhood diseases against which we were vaccinated. We didn't die of scarlet fever because we had antibiotics. Uh, we didn't die of whooping cough or, or, per, or, or some of the diseases that, that took children at an early age because we were uh, vaccinated against it. Now, you know, do vaccinations carry a potential downside? Maybe. But the upside of vaccination is, is, is uh, obvious and very palpable. And for those of us who have lived to a ripe old age, many of us have gotten here because of the advantages we had. So should big pharma be uh, carefully watched? Yes. Should drugs be carefully tested before they're put on the market? Absolutely. But, you know, are we endangered by someone who maybe operates on a knee-jerk and conspirational basis uh, with respect to, uh, to public health? I think very possibly. And I think that loyalty to Donald Trump, number one, uh, and number two, a popularity in the in the uh, in the world of influencers on the internet are not necessarily the basis upon which we can decide whether someone is going to bring sound public policy into something like public health. Uh, I don't know. Do we, we have some callers, uh, uh, Calvin? Yeah, we, we have, have uh, Debbie from Bayside. 
All right. Debbie? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, going back to the first part of your conversation about the authoritarians like Orban and, and others, um, the right, of course, we know for decades, starting with uh, McCarthy and the John Birch Society, were so opposed to anything that smacked of communism or authoritarianism. And that was the case up until just very recent few years. What, how has the right been manipulated into thinking, for example, Tucker Carlson's trip to Putin and some of the people cozying up to him and the fact that Trump will side most likely with Putin when it comes to resolving the Ukrainian crisis. How did this happen? Well, it's very, very interesting, Debbie that, Debbie, that you mentioned that because Calvin and I, before we went on the air, I asked Calvin, I said, Cal well, in fact, I'll ask you now, Calvin. Calvin, if you were going to sit down with a friend and have an animated discussion about something that worries you about a national trend or, or something, what is it that you would probably be talking about? And what did you say? Yeah, well, I s said uh, that the right Republicans specifically, mega Republicans specifically, seems to have this... Uh, um, at least apologetic in the best cases, but in the worst cases, downright um support for Russia, and the confusion that I've felt over that sentiment and the shift that how that's been over the last twenty years. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it is remarkable that the Republican Party, which has always was the most hawkish of of all of the political movements uh, during the Cold War, uh, has somehow swung in a in a uh, in a direction of, of extreme sympathy towards uh authoritarian governments i mean russia is not a communist government okay russia is an authoritarian government uh victor orban is bringing authoritarianism to hungary uh trump will talk about and be sympathetic to the and and, and want to have the same kind of power as as Xi uh, in, in China, because all of his generals are loyal to him and stand up. He, he said the same about Kim Jong-un. I, I asked the same question. Why has the right become so sort of seduced by the attractiveness of authoritarianism? And I suspect it's because uh, they are worried about the inexorable movement of what, it, what will happen in the, con, in the context of a plurality? What is the, plur, the, the vote, the Democratic vote going to look like? And, and how will that play out in terms of politics, uh, Republican and Democrat, uh, in the long run? Now, this last election suggested there were trends towards Republicans uh, amongst even those who have been in the past counted upon as being Democrat. And I think the great substitution theory, this conspiracy theory that's been talked about, that that the Democrats are basically sponsoring immigrants because these immigrants will substitute uh, the the population will become substituted not no longer to be Western European as it always has been, but the great substitution will be of people from other parts of the world of other colors, other ethnicities, um, and that was viewed as a as a cultural danger. And, and I think it's part of the cultural danger that is talked about by Donald Trump when he says he's going to protect uh, the fabric of America, the, the blood of America. Uh, but I, I'm surprised by the extent to which it seems to have caught on amongst the uh, intellectuals. So the ideological basis for the Republican Party seems to have moved in this direction. The, the, the right wing think tanks who are embracing Viktor Orban and and. I guess it might be that there's just viewed as this legitimacy towards uh, overcoming the plural vote, you know, the, the, the result of democracy that could occur with, with the change in the demographics of America by having a strong arm, uh, a, a strong man leader uh, and a government organization that will uh, overcome the plural vote with, uh, with strong man powers. And, it seems so cynical, but then again, 
we watched uh, gerrymandering being carried out in a very cynical fashion. And obviously gerrymandering was all about trying to suppress votes in a fashion, or at least the result of votes. And so maybe there just is a very cynical operation ongoing here uh, that's, that's ideologically driven uh, and driven by the intellectual right to, to create a government form that is this illiberal democracy a meaning that uh, that the uh, that a strong that a strong person president will have enough power to uh, s to maintain power in a manner that would would hold on to it for the conservative movement. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, that's my only explanation for it. I'd be interested if we have callers who have a, a different view. Uh, I think we in fact have Tom from Los Angeles on the line. Tom. Yes. Good morning. Sir. Good morning, Sandy. Um, first, I am a proud FDR Democrat, and it's been the regressive side of the aisle and their goal since Reagan to defeat FDR and the New Deal because it gave too much power to the common person. And what happened, in my opinion, is first you have Ronald Reagan saying that government is the problem. So basically, let's tear down government. Government doesn't work. And then you have, I'll, I'll speed up a few years, but then you have in Wisconsin, one of the most wonderful places in the world and the nicest people in the world. And what they did is they brought Scott Walker in. And that's the same time that money and politics uh, through Citizens United became legal bribery for the donors. And basically- Tom, it's Tom, stay, stay on. Wait, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just interrupting you for the break. Stay on, we'll talk to you at the end, and we come back on the other side. <clears throat> You're listening to Civic Media. Find the latest news, information, and archives of all your favorite shows on the Civic Media website, civicmedia.us. Good morning. The Earl Ingram Show, Sandy Williams in for Earl Ingram. Earl's uh, indisposed, I think, would be the best thing to describe. Earl's uh, having a, uh, well, he's going through the, the rite of passage we all have uh, in, in middle age this morning, a, a colonoscopy, if you can believe it. Uh, some people might wish that upon him, but not me. Uh, uh, we've got time on the line. The music I'm playing is relates to royalty king of America. Uh, I guess there's a... I'm, talking today about a fear I have that we might be uh, uh, putting into the White House shortly someone who has a view that maybe that's what he wants to be. Tom, you were saying about, you were talking about the the, the trend we have in, uh, in terms of the right shifting in the direction of authoritarianism. Absolutely. So I'm just going to start over if it's okay, but, um, you know, basically the aggressive side of the aisle, their main goal was to defeat FDR's New Deal because it gave too much power to the common person. If we look at from the 40s to the 70s, the middle class had the most power that it probably ever has had. And because of that, they had people going to the streets and they had people you know, fighting for their rights and they had all these different things and they needed to calm down the rabble rousers and put them in their place. So basically the regressives and Ronald Reagan brought about uh, through the Powell document Buckley versus Vallejo and First National Bank versus Blotti, which said corporations are people and money is free speech. Then you move to when George, I call him war criminal Bush for the W, um, 
he comes to him and they have the Supreme Court that basically puts Citizens United into place, which says corporations can give unlimited amount of money to campaigns. So then what you got is, like I said, people in Wisconsin who are wonderful people and love their neighbors and all the different things. Um, and I would say a very, very uh, sound Jude Judeo-Christian type values. And what they wanted to do was to divide and conquer. And Scott Walker said that directly to Widow Hendricks in a YouTube clip. And I recommend everyone look at it. But basically what it was, was the Koch brothers and the different uh, Bradley Foundation and all the different uh, people wanted to turn neighbors against neighbors and people against people. And they actually did it. And they thought, wow, if we can do this in an honest state like Wisconsin, then we can take this nationwide. And that's basically what they have done. Now what they've done is they still want to think, or they still want to destroy government so they can sink it in the bathtub. So it's no longer there. So we are moving into the authoritarian dictatorship through Project 2025. However, I do have a little bit of hope, Sandy, believe it or not. Um, and that is that, you know, when you're talking about the administrative state and you're talking about all these different um, uh, departments, whether it's the Department of Education, whether it's the Department, um, Defense Department, all those different things, they have over, you know, 2 million, 3 million people behind them that are also part of we the people government. And I wasn't thinking about this until, you know, when people start bringing up like Matt Gates having this many people under him and all these different, it's about managing a number and a gross number of people that I somehow think that they might be a little too, um, I don't want to say stupid, but I will, I guess. Um, I, I, I think they might not have enough organizational skills to actually pull this off. And I well, think that you know, people maybe in those areas will be able to actually make a difference and, you know, over overcome, well, at least here in America. And that would be my question to you. In the other countries, has this been the playbook? Has the playbook been to... Well, yes. This? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in, in Victor Orban, the, the other countries, uh, the, 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 they've gone to great lengths to try to destroy civil service and the rights of, and to try to extend the power of appointment of the elected official deeper and deeper into the bureaucracy so that uh, jobs become much more like patronage like they used to be before the uh, the development of civil service in, in America. I mean, we should all understand the, the right seems to forget all the examples of history, but the whole reason we have civil service is that it used to be the, 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 the situation where jobs in government were patronage and it wasn't about competence; it was simply about political loyalty, and and, the, and it created essentially an incompetent, corrupt government. Um, but Project Twenty Twenty Five thinks about exactly what you're talking about, Tom. And Project Twenty Twenty Five wants to set up a, an institute of education for everyone coming into the government to train them on how to harness the bureaucracy, how to essentially uh, overcome the the resistance of what. They call that bureaucracy, the, the, all those thousands of people who are below the appointment level, below these 15,000 people who can be fired by the White House. Uh, they they want to set up an institute to train the new 15,000 people who are going to come in and replace all those who get fired and, all, and, and to be replaced by people who have pledged loyalty and fealty to the president. They want to train them on how to control that, that, uh, that lower echelon people, the people who are the flywheels who stay in government, uh, term in and term out. And um, so they understand that complexity. And I'm worried that they might actually be working hard at, at doing a better job, and in, in my mind, a, a horrible job of, of uh, containing that and controlling that in a manner that will give the White House a great deal more power. Uh, we'll be back shortly.
The national news cycle never stops, but it can be hard to find news about your local community. Civic Media is dedicated to providing quality local and state news coverage across Wisconsin. With the Civic Media app, you can get notifications about local stories that matter to you and your community. Find the free Civic Media app in your phone's app store and choose notifications from the menu to tell us what kind of news you want to hear about. 